Welcome to New Thinking for a New World, a Tilburg Foundation podcast. I am Alan Stoga, your host. Each week, I bring you conversations with people who think differently about the great issues that are shaping our world. Geopolitics, disruptive tech, mass migration, the changing climate, culture wars, all of it is grist for our mill. I hope you enjoy listening. I also hope you will let me know what you think and that you join the conversation at telbergfoundation.org. And now for today's episode of New Thinking for a New World. Thank you and welcome. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Mike Nickenchuk. I'm a board member of the Talberg Foundation, a member of the advisory board of the Counter Extremism Project, and a program manager at the WEND Collective. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing and managing a wonderful conversation with two friends and colleagues that are involved in an issue that I think is of incredible political relevance and only increasingly so, and that's the topic of dealing with the integration of persons who have been associated with extremist violence. The phenomenon of violent extremism is growing globally. It doesn't know religion or creed. It spans all those different categories where once it was confined to specific ideology or identity groups, at least in public discourse and discussion. Now we see it really across societal, cross-cultural issue with the rise in violent extremist ideologies and violent extremist actions showing up in many different places around the world. So we're going to deal today with this topic of why do folks get involved in this type of violence? How do folks disengage from this type of violence? And what are the specific ways that folks are at the cutting edge of figuring out how to most effectively create situations and programs for individuals to really re-enter society in healthy ways as individuals who are pro-social members of the society, and not just not at risk of committing acts of violent extremism again, but that are really integrated in a healthy, socially positive, empowered way to engage as productive and peaceful citizens. With me today, I have two friends and colleagues, uh, Noah Tucker and uh, Dr. Juncal fernandez Um Dr. Juncal, who we'll hear from first, is a development and program manager at the Counter Extremism Project a New York-based organization and nonpartisan policy organization formed in 2014 to combat the growing extremist threat across an array of ideological persuasions. And we have Noah Tucker, who's a program associate at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs Central Asia program. He was previously the executive editor for the Not In Our Name film and television series, which was the first Central Asia region-wide project designed to prevent violent extremism through community dialogues in areas most directly affected by recruiting to Syria for the conflict over the past several years. Both Hunkal and Noah have tremendous experience in working with individuals, particularly women and children who have been brought back to their home countries after they had gone to Syria and Iraq to be members of the then Islamic State that we all remember very vividly in our collective consciousness and which was finally uh, dismantled in 2019. Um, Let's start first with Dr. Hunkal. I have a question for you. If you want to, first of all, introduce anything else about yourself, anything that I've left off. I am good. You're you're way too kind with your introduction about <laughs> of me already. So we're good. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, no, you too. Thank you for yeah, having Thanks me. for being here, you as well. So, Hunkal, um, for folks who don't have much context, who are just listening in and tuning into the Talberg Foundation's podcast, which has yet to have an episode on this issue of extremism, I want to offer some context. And you have worked uh, not with folks just who are exiting violent extremist groups, but also with individuals, um, you know, who are on that critical decision point, who might have just recently entered as well. I know much, much of your work has focused in the United States as well with, as you say in the bio, folks of different ideological persuasions. So help us understand who becomes radicalized and why? Well, um, first of all, thanks thanks again for, for having me, Mike. Um, I That is actually a very difficult question, so you're putting me on the spot from very early on in the conversation already. Um, I think I'd start by um, highlighting that the, the word radical itself has, unfortunately, 
become something with a very negative connotation. And it hasn't always been so. I mean, there's a lot of radicals throughout history. I don't know, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, who didn't advocate for violence, and they were nonetheless, you know, considered radicals. So I think that for the purpose of today's conversation, I I'd be I, I think it would be good if we changed our language and maybe frame the question around who becomes a violent extremist or who radicalizes in, into violence. And um, with that in mind, I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but no, there is no specific profile of people who, you know, become involved or become radicalized into violence. In fact, research has long debunked that people become violent extremists because they're they're mentally ill. That's indeed not always the case because they are illiterate uh, or because they come from a lower socioeconomic class. Um, the, the issue is, is much more complex than that. And in my experience, working with uh, folks that have been involved in, in Salafi jihadist groups as well as far-right extremist groups, I think um, it boils down to two key words, which are identity and belonging. Let me let me define these terms a little bit better. Um, when I speak about identity, I speak about one's beliefs, um, our values and practices, those things that, that define who we are as an individual. And of course, these also, also determine the role that we play in all levels of, of interaction that we have, whether it be our immediate environment of friends and, and family, our community, society as a whole. And of course, those contributions that we make through those interactions define our sense of belonging. Um, but of course, our identity, the way we identify ourselves, also determine how other members of society view, view us as and how they perceive the role that uh, we can play. There's there's ample examples here. I'm, I'm with you, Hunkal, on that. I'm with you that you know, folks who are, have been historically marginalized, who are from vilified or marginalized identity groups, who are desperate for a sense to belong. Um, you know, in Latin America, we see similar impulses in young people who end up joining uh, gangs. So you're still talking about literally tens of millions of people who fit into that category. Yet we know that violent extremism or joining a violent extremist group is an incredibly rare phenomenon. Uh, given that there's tens of millions of people that still fit into those buckets that you're defining. And that's where I was going to to go next is when violence, I mean, when that balance is broken, right, between between identity and, and how based on that identity you can have that sense of belonging. When that's broken, there's people that, you know, want to change that status quo. And then there's an even smaller percentage of people that believe violence is the only way to change that status quo. And so who chooses violence? I am afraid that there's so much at play here. And as you say, so many millions of people that are from, that are either A, effectively marginalized societies or societies, excuse me, individuals, or that perceive themselves to be uh, marginalized, that I, I wouldn't be able to, to give a very concrete answer as to who, because indeed there is no profile and maybe Noah has something to, to add in this regard. So no, we're spending millions, uh, if not tens of millions of dollars on what the US government and other governments call targeted violence prevention, meaning efforts to prevent um, both individual attacks that are identity based or hate based, and to prevent individuals from joining organizations, uh, you know, who promote the use of violence um, on targets based on their social or political or religious identities. So if there's no profile, as Hunkal is saying, and it's rather this confluence of factors that are rooted in marginalization and social identity issues, what is that, what are those tens of millions being spent on? That is a very good question. Um, <laughs> and one that I, I guess I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, in the area that I work in, which is primarily um, Central Asia. Um, and Central Asia has a, a lot of surprises in it in terms of involvement in Syrian conflict and involvement in um, involvement in particular uh, in groups like ISIS, um, but but not only ISIS. Um, you know, we see 
um, a lot of things that defy our stereotypes and expectations there, um, both with people who are mobilized and people who are returning. Um, the first one of those is that um, people go, people went um, to the conflict in Syria from Central Asia, oftentimes in multi-generational family units, um, not just these um not just these young men um, who are seeking identity. You know, I, I want to say I agree with everything um, that Hunkal has said, um, and and it, it represents the best that we can do in the literature. But I know in Hunkal's own work um, herself, she is is one of the best to point out that you know, oftentimes when we focus only on ideology and only on this process of radicalization, we're leaving out many people um, who are pulled into the groups simply by their relationships um, with others. And, you know, when Hunkal mentioned belonging, um, that's a big part of that. And, and, and it, it is covered with identity, too. You're a member of a family. You belong to a family. Um, so in Kazakhstan, for example, one country that gave us sort of um, straightforward numbers for the mobilization to Syria, um, and most of those in Kazakhstan went to join ISIS, um, women and children outnumbered men five to one in that mobilization. And so when we're talking about a five-year-old who is taken by their parents to join ISIS, um, we see this isn't a matter of anybody asking them what they believed or <clears throat> anything about, um, you know, their perceptions of their own marginalization or something like that. Oftentimes, um, people in this particular conflict in that particular place were pulled into the conflict by the decisions of other family members. Um, and our models for um, how to prevent that and how to help that person reintegrate um, don't really take that into consideration. Um, many of them are based on this idea that um, everything is about fixing the radicalization, about sort of bleaching the ideology out of someone's brain. <laughs> and then afterwards, you know, they will be safe. They'll no longer be involved or be in danger to be involved in, in these kinds of things. In Central Asia in particular, and this is not to pick on them in any way, because, you know, our approach in the West is certainly not better um, often, but there is this... Um, assumption often, I think an assumption that they inherited um, from uh, from the United States and Europe that these mobilizations are ideological. And so if we remove the ideology, then the person is no longer at risk for other adverse outcomes. Um, sort of this idea that um, in a lot of the focus groups that we did in, in Central Asia, in communities where people had been mobilized, they would talk about people being zombified by these master psychologist recruiters and things like that. And so the idea is that if you just sort of break the spell, if you deprogram them in the way that you would, um, say, in the 1970s from somebody joining a cult in California or something like that, um, that this would solve the problems and, and that they would be on course to live a healthy life afterwards. I, I think it's, I mean, it, it's interesting thinking of the Central Asian context and some of the, how I think on some level, it's easier for folks to understand and extend a little bit of empathy to the complex political, social identity drivers uh, that pushed, you know, thousands of folks into the arms of the Islamic State by choice or by, you know, by force if their, their, male, their male partners, you know, told them they had to go to Syria, etc., but bringing that to the United States, I mean, Honkal, you have done a lot of work with the far right as well. And I think it's a lot more difficult for Americans to extend that same empathy that they can extend to a woman or a child who was forced into the Islamic State um, versus someone in, let's say, suburban Washington, D.C., where you're sitting, you know, who decided to go storm the Capitol building or who decided to join a neo-Nazi group or to burn down a synagogue. Um, you know, let's talk about your particular brand of zombies. <laughs> Don't call them that. Well, I'm using Noah's term here. I mean, the, <laughs> this, this idea, because I think that pervades the public consciousness that these are somehow brainwashed individuals and 
their stories are sort of stripped of their complexity and just we have to focus on this ideology. And I think it's interesting that are we okay with a society as long as this person isn't a white supremacist if they're if they become an addict? I mean, I, I do have to say that that one of the one of the main reasons that I don't want them called zombies is because, you know, um they're not. Um you'd be surprised at the amount of highly, highly intelligent individuals that, that I have encountered throughout my work. Highly, highly intelligent. Um, and which makes it sometimes even more difficult to to put the pieces of these puzzles together, right? It's like you are highly intelligent. You see the world with a lot of complexity. You understand the complexities of the world. And, and, and yet you end up finding a solution in something that, that is contrary to what any seemingly, you know, no, I was going to use the word normal, but again, a very poor choice of words. What the mainstream society would consider, you know, the, the adequate solution, which would be, well, luckily you live in a democracy. You go ahead and vote for whatever change that you want happening. And so th there's two things. And, and what I've, but again, it boils down to, to the word Desperation. And, and I think sometimes the people that I work with don't, don't actually realize that that is what it boils down to. Um, sometimes when I have to, to explain my, my work and how um, people ask me often, like, don't you get frustrated? It's, yes, I do, do get frustrated. But on the other hand, I, I talk to a lot of individuals that, you know, have told me flat out, who is talking to me about, you know, white privilege when I live in a trailer? can't make ends meet at the end of the month. Half of my family is, addi is addicted to fentanyl or some other kind of drug. Um, I can't feed my kids. I can't provide for my children and so on and so forth. And they're telling me that I have some sort of privilege over a population. And of course, this begs for a way longer conversation than, than this answer that I'm giving right now. But based on that, well, you, you kind of come to terms with the realization of, well, there there's people that have simply just given up, given up. And then the only way that they find of pushing this forward is, well, not necessarily storming the capital, but yes, you know, believing in a system where, you know, rules are set. They are, you know, the people that would have some sort of advantage over others, or at least depending on who you ask, some sort of egalitarian system where, where everybody's on the same page and just the rules are the rules and, and you follow them. And um, yes, that, that is, I, I know it's very difficult to, to understand sometimes, especially for, from a U.S. perspective, but there's a lot of United States between the East Coast and the West Coast, a lot of the United States. And I've seen throughout the years that people, those living in that, that in between are not necessarily happy with, uh, how things are going. They have their grievances, which I think is, is a key word that we haven't yet touched upon miraculously. The, the word grievance that always comes out when having these kind of discussions. Um, and the solution to their grievances is, well, I can't express my grievances because then I'm labeled as being something, being whatever it is. And as, as unfortunate as this is, another comment that I've gotten often is, I've seen people go down the what is called the radicalization pathway, you know, several times. And another question that I get, another, sorry, another sentence that I've gotten a lot is, well, they want Nazis, we'll give them Nazis, which is, you know, people being pushed down that road simply for not being allowed to express certain grievances. And I know this opens a whole can of worms. I am very well aware. I'm just putting on the table what my experience has been. I'm not saying anything else. The Telberg Foundation has a deep commitment to encouraging global values-based leadership wherever we can find it. With the Telberg Leaders Mentoring Leaders Program, we are looking to identify and nurture emerging leaders with outsized potential. TLML aims to leverage the Telberg Foundation's global network to accelerate emerging leaders' growth and impact. Are you someone or do you know someone who should be part of the TLML program? Applications will be accepted for March 15th. Go to telbergfoundation.org for more information. 
And how does how does gender factor into this, Uncal? I mean, with the the impression, if I ask if I ask the audience to sort of conjure up their image of an extremist, ninety nine percent chance that they're going to conjure up a man or a, a, a male presenting person in their mind's eye. Um, but I know statistically there's also a massive correlation between um, radicalization into extremist violence and things like misogyny. However, Noah is dealing in a context where Kazakhstan, for example, has been involved in the repatriation of more than 700 women and children from ISIS territories or formerly ISIS territories. And in the U.S., we have seen uh, you know, increasing number of, of, of women that have been detained and arrested on extremism related charges. So how does gender factor into this from your perspective? And same question to Noah. No, do, do you want to go ahead? And I'll chip in. And I recognize that this is contextually very different too, because even this idea of gender in a central Asian context, which is both post Soviet and Islamic and secular and nomadic, and traumatized, et cetera, et cetera. All these are obviously massive contextually different scenarios, but I still am curious, you know, how this is showing up. Yeah, I think the the emphasis on context is one that's important um, because I think one of the other shortcomings that we all struggle with in terms of these um, these very generalized assumptions about radicalization and radicalization pathways is that, you know, this is some sort of universal illness. It's some sort of universal phenomenon that affects all people in the same way. Um, but I think that there's, there's pretty general agreement in the field um, at this point of, you know, people who have, uh, who've thrown the best resources that they can find um, against this. You know, Mike, you mentioned earlier the amount of money that we spend trying to prevent um, ideologically motivated violence. There's a fantastic amount of money that we've spent trying to study it as well. Um, I think in some cases, um, really kind of mind boggling. Uh, since September 11th, I, I can't think of another issue that has had as much um, attention um, in the United States and Europe devoted towards it, um, you know, beyond really shared problems um, like cancer or COVID or, or something like that. Um, and one of the things that they, you know, we find after after more than 20 years and millions and millions of dollars looking at this is that we don't have good generalizable answers for these things. And I think gender, the gender aspect is similar, um, but one that one of the key takeaways to that is that it is unsurprisingly not as simple as we would assume. Um, so in, you know, I think it is, it's important to keep in mind, as I said, you know, earlier that there are varying levels of agency and people being mobilized into a violent extremist group. So that's where radicalization sometimes doesn't play a part at all. Um, but then there are lots of other cases, um, where women, take this choice very voluntarily, um, where, um, you know, looking at Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, you know, I can think of a number of cases where women um, have left their husbands, left their children at home and gone to join um, the group, seizing their own agency in a situation where they didn't have agency before. Um, and so that, that becomes a, a contributing factor in itself. So I guess the, <laughs> it's, <clears throat> it's not a good soundbite, um, but it, it is to say maybe the answer is, it's very complicated and um, it differs according to context. Well, it, it's complicated, but, but, but no, what you're also hinting at there, even if it's implicit, is that the, the choice, the very agentic choice to join a radical extremist group is in and of itself only possible insofar as the woman was not experiencing full agency before. So if we're thinking of this as sort of a revolutionary act on her part, it's still, it's, yes, it's problematic and it's, it's a, it's a problematic decision, but it is still fundamentally the product of misogyny. Yes. Hunkal is, is, y'all, you know, she, she, I, I had, I had sense from her that she's jump, wants to jump in here. So I'll, I'll stop. What, um, what I wanted to say is, as, as Noah was speaking, thank you, Noah, because, um, 
I think that that a lot of the times when it comes associating women with with violent extremism, the discourse, I'm, I'm terribly sorry as a woman, I do have to say that is infantilizing. We um, claim, you know, gender equality. We, came, we claim uh, women being equal to men. But when it comes to violence, then, I mean, I, I understand. I understand biologically, and this, again, another conversation, biologically, the role of women is more, you know, the, the motherly, the, the, the protective, the, the, you know, caregiver. However, and this is not just about the Islamic State. It's not just about the far right. You can take a look at other groups. Take a look at FARC. Take a look at Shining Path. Take a look at the Tamil Tigers. You know, there's there's violent movements across history where women have played a very active role. Is that a role? Uh, is that a result of misogyny? Probably, because, um, for example, and I'm I'm going to divert divert here a little bit, but when it comes to um, Tamil Tigers, as I was saying, Shining Path, uh, Fark. Their involvement in the group was a result of indeed highly misogynistic societies, and that felt like a liberation. Right? In the case of the Islamic State, no, no, I put it very well. And I'm not that familiar with the uh, Central Asian context, but for example, a great deal of ISIS propaganda towards both women and men, but in particular women, is come to join us and you can be your true self. You can be a true Muslim. So they're providing that sense of agency. In the United States, when it comes to the far right, the fact that the men play more prominent roles as it always is, does not mean that they are not (laughs) supported in the background by women. Whether, I mean, then the conversation is one of whether they voluntarily choose to play that secondary role of being, you know, uh, the, the, the supportive wife and letting the, their husband do the thing that is, as I say, a different conversation. But if one takes a look at uh, the, the social cultural dynamics currently uh, happening in the United States, there's a lot of women that don't agree with, you know, the, the route things, the route things are going. And for them, you know, the, the true woman just, you know, has a secondary role, staying at home with the children. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, whether that is a byproduct, as you were saying, on misogyny, I guess that that's a, you know, secondary conversation. Well, not secondary conversation, but a parallel conversation to this. And but what it boils down to is, do they? Is there that? Does that agency exist by which women decide to take a part? I, I do think so. I really do think so. And saying otherwise is, I, I'm sorry, I infantilizing this, this whole thing and and goes against everything that, you know, actual feminism um, strives towards. Well, it, it's just, it's interesting, not even just in this context, but to consider the relationship between agency and oppression, especially in the context of intergenerational trauma or in contexts where a person has been historically oppressed for whatever reason. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the root cause of all of this is misogyny or that that's the, that's the root cause behind every woman's decision to to join an extremist group. But I'm just, you know, it's interesting that it, even that push for agency can be seen to a certain degree as a product of limited agency in the past. Um, you know, you both work in what we call either, you know, tertiary prevention, meaning working with individuals who have already been identified as being part of extremist movements or in rehabilitation or exit programming for these folks. And as you're talking about these issues, there's something I think glaringly obvious to me and to a lot of listeners, which is that these individuals that are exiting violent extremist organizations are going back into the same environments that remain completely or almost completely unchanged from the time that they left those communities. And you've both said it very clearly that the pathway into radicalization is a conflagration of individual and ecosystemic factors that in a certain combination, you know, push an individual towards this path. Or if one thing is different, two things are different, push them towards another antisocial or negative behavioral pathway. So when we're talking about communities being unchanged and a person is coming back from former ISIS territories or from participation in a neo-Nazi movement back to their home community, what works if the environment that helped produce these individuals or produce these decisions, let me say, is unchanged? What works? And what's, why is there a cause for any hope? 
That's a that's a damning long pause right there. Yes, no, it's because I, I'm checking to see whether <laughs> whether no one wants to take this. But I I see from his face he's just dying for me to jump on board and then. <laughs> Uh, just for those who are just listening in, he is indeed nodding with his head. So, so I guess I'll take it. Um, so I have, I, I actually want to to pose a question in, relate to, in relation to this. Are communities actually unchanged? Because when we're speaking about, when we're speaking about, you know, they remain unchanged, we usually talk about the structural, the structural, um, the structural Social political circumstances of the community, and and I think you're right. And a lot a lot of times those those haven't changed. But um, I, I think there there's there's room here to to talk about the commun- you know larger communities. Maybe for example in in the United States, you know where people have also gone and and joined extremist groups overseas, um, and maybe what are known as quote unquote radicalization hotspots. Know the, the the smaller, more limited geographically uh, population nucleuses where a lot of people happen to have joined a certain extremist group. Have things actually changed when they return? Even if it's just for the fact that a now they are definitely you know in the eye or in the spotlight for um, both author- uh, authorities and security forces across the country, and you know maybe. Since you were speaking about earlier intergenerational trauma, you know what what legacy does that the amount of people leaving in your community as a whole being targeted for the actions of yet a few? Uh, does that actually allow the community to remain the same, or perhaps it generates some collective admission of this was the wrong choice, whether it's through subtle or obvious social cues? Noah, how is this showing up in Central Asian communities? Um, I think it's a it's a very mixed picture. Um, there are, I mean, there are communities where I would say, I mean, first of all, Central Asia is the mobilization in Central Asia was characterized by hotspots um, in a sort of extreme way. Um, you know, you have most places didn't have any mobilization at all. Um, some places had a lot of mobilization. Um, and that has to do, you know, with, with factors that are unique to that area. And it, of course, it has to do a lot with the social networks that those people were in. You know, generally people were recruited by people they already knew, um, and not by strangers. And, um, they, in particular, some of those communities were already, um, let's say disproportionately targeted as a security threat by security services because of their different aspects of their identity, whether it was the way that they presented their faith, whether it was the way that they were born into an ethnicity, into a, into a minority group, um, or something along those lines, you know, very, a, a common thread between these things is that generally these are communities that are already on the losing end of the social contract. And unfortunately, in a lot of these cases, um, the, um, the outflow of people to Syria only reified that idea that this community is dangerous and that we need to police them extra aggressively um, because that that tends to be the the approach to these things um, in some ways that are certainly understandable um, because violent extremist groups are violent and so they are a threat against public safety um, you know there are other questions about whether I mean there there's a loop that we have um, in in communities across the world where over securitizing and over policing people can tend to lead to the opposite outcomes of, of what we hope. So that certainly has complicated things, but I think where we can find success in that um, is in part uh, making an honest assessment of what was it, what was happening in these communities that, that caused this, what did people and if we want to prevent recidivism in the case that a person got something out of being a member um, of this group and, and had something that they wanted to receive from it, I think we have to ask um, really honest questions about what what did the person get 
out of being a member, um, even if they didn't necessarily join, um, even if they didn't necessarily join voluntarily or sort of actively participate in this ideology, what did they get from this membership from the community that that was a part of that? And and can we replace that in a pro-social way? Yes. I mean, it, it actually um, taps into what Noah was saying, what you were talking about, um, hope. You know, why is there cause, cause for hope? And everything that we, we've been discussing about who decides to join and why. And um, I just wanted to briefly read a very brief uh, quote from Paulo Freire, if, if I may. Um, it says, hopelessness is a form of silence, of denying the world and fleeing from it. The dehumanization resulting from an unjust order is not a cause for despair, but for hope, leading to the incessant pursuit of the humanity denied by injustice. Hope, however, does not consist in crossing one's arms and waiting. As long as I fight, I am moved by hope. And if I fight with hope, then I can wait. And mm-hmm. so um, I think, I mean, I was reading this last night and it and it truly resonated with me. And it's why, why do people join? Well, th- there's a sense of, of perceived injustice, at least, whether the injustice is real or perceived. That's, as I say, a different conversation. But that willingness to overcome that injustice in, in whatever form is, I guess, another good answer of, of to why people join. And also, if, if we can conclude that hope is, you know, the, the opportunity of, of meeting and, and implementing a change that is desired, and this quote-unquote desirable change is a social transformation that leads to, you know, an improvement of life quality, of, of human equality and, and respect. That is why I think there is reason for hope in so far that the conversations like this that we're having, I, I think by touching on the fact that this is not just an individual thing, but also a response um, of the way an individual may interact with his or her environment or their environment. Well, how, how, God, I mean, how, how I understand that Freire quote, and this is a perfect way to conclude this, this, you know, initial conversation on this topic Ironically, we see a lot of extremist groups investing in that concept of hope, of they, the change that they are creating. They are somehow, the, they have surveyed and seen this injustice and they're offering, of course, an incredibly violent and, and evil pathway towards what still nonetheless looks like hope for the adherent or the participant. And I think, if anything, it's a call to action on the part of both law enforcement and social service actors to also make sure that we are equally in the business of seeing and communicating that injustice and actually giving meaningful pathways to people for hope. Because if not, it's going to be this perpetual struggle between convincing folks to pursue change through pro-social pathways or through incredibly violent and destructive ones. Thank you. That's so so much of a nicer way of putting what I wanted to say. Thank you. (laughs) Thank thank you both. you know, Noah, uh, please, you know, let, let folks know how we can learn more about the things that you do. What's your, how can we learn more about you and what you do in Central Asia? Um, I think I still have a website called noahtucker.net. Um, I don't, I don't, okay, that's good to know. Um, I need to update it, but I don't, um, I stay away from social media in part because I spent too many years looking at what violent extremists do on social media. <laughs> um, but uh, I have that. And then, um, you know, I, I am currently at the Honda Center uh, for the study of terrorism and political violence. Um, and they, they post updates, uh, at through St. Their, Andrews, yeah? at St. Andrews. Yeah. In, in Scotland, they post updates of, of things that I'm involved in. And Dr. Honkal through the uh, counter extremism project website, anywhere else we can follow what you do. Um, I, I have Twitter, but it's mainly symbolic. So, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it's symbolic. The feeling is mutual. Thank you, Mike, for for having us. And thank you for letting me be a part of this. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Thinking for New World. I'm Alan Stoga, podcast host, and I look forward to your joining our next conversation. Remember, tell us what you think at telbergfoundation.org.